Welcome to my channel. Let's have an overview of the small intestine. The small intestine is seen between the stomach and the large intestine. This is the stomach up here, highlighted in blue. And down here is where we have the large intestine. So the region of the GI tract that is located between the stomach and the large intestine is the small intestine. The small intestine is about 6.5 meters in length, it's about 2.5 centimeter in diameter. It is the longest region of the GIT. And of course, it's seen to be folded over itself. So why then is the name small intestine? It is called the small intestine because of the caliber. If you look at the caliber of the small intestine, you see that it is smaller than what is seen in other regions of the GI tract. And that is why it is so-called the small intestine. The reason why it is called the small intestine is not attributed to the fact that it is long because it is actually the longest part of the GI tract, but because of the diameter of this structure. So let's go further to establish the functions of the small intestine. The small intestine is a region of the GIT that helps to complete the digestion of chyme. Chyme is partially digested food that is coming from the stomach. This is the stomach highlighted in yellow. And we have food particles that are partially digested and are being directed to the small intestine. And the region of the small intestine where they are first directed into is in the duodenum. Then before they go further to the other regions of the small intestine, it is within the small intestine that there's going to be a complete digestion of this partially digested food that is coming from the stomach. And how it does this is is through the release from the gallbladder and also the pancreas. This is the gallbladder that is highlighted in red. And in the gallbladder, we have the bile that is secreted by the liver. And this is the liver here that is responsible for the production of bile, after which it is then stored in the gallbladder. The bile is used for the emulsification of fat or the breakdown of fat food particles. And this is released through the common by dots. This is the common by dots harrowed in red. And it is through this dot that by is released into the duodenum, which is the first region of the small intestine, where it comes in contact with the chime that is coming from the stomach to completely digest or emulsify fats. We also have secretion from the pancreas. This is the pancreas that secretes pancreatic juice. The pancreatic juice is made up of enzymes, which include tripsin, lipase, and hamylase, which are needed to completely break down protein, carbohydrate, and protein. This pancreatic juice is released through the pancreatic dot and this is the pancreatic dot and it is through this dot that the enzymes that is contained within the pancreatic juice is able to unite with the chyme that is coming from the stomach to also completely digest protein fats and also carbohydrates so you can see that the small intestine where we have the duodenum as the first region of the small intestine is through this region that bile that is produced by the liver and also pancreatic juice that is produced by the pancreas is able to enter into the lumen of the small intestine to completely digest food particles before the process of absorption will occur. Then the second function that I want to highlight is the absorption of nutrients. The wall of the small intestine is characterized by infoldings. So if you look at the internal or the mucosal lining of the small intestine, you see that they are thrown into folds. And these are called circular folds or plica circularis. So this is what is seen in this pattern. You see that the internal wall is not smooth. You see that they are thrown into folds. If you look at this picture and try to extract this presentation, this is the kind of alignment that will be seen. And if you look deep into this, because the structural configuration of the internal mucosa of the small intestine is what actually enhances this absorptive characteristics. So as they are thrown into folds, if you drive a bit more on these folds that are created, you see that the surface are also seen with microvilli, which are specialized characteristics of the apical surface of the epithelium lining of the mucosa of the small intestine. So if you look deep on the infoldings, you see that you have blood vessels that also penetrate into these infoldings. This is shown in this image here. You can see blood capillaries that are driven into this elevation so as to enhance the process by which nutrients 
will be taken up into the blood strain. So this is the kind of representation that is seen within the internal lining of the small intestine. And this, of course, is, will be able to enhance the process of absorption of nutrients and also minerals. So now looking at the general configuration of features of the small intestine, we see that they are very long. It's a very long tube that actually folds over itself. In surface presentation, they are actually thrown into folds. And this is what is shown here. It's folded over itself. And if you look at the internal configuration, they are also thrown into folds. And this is what is also exhibited in this image. The internal mucosa are not smooth. So they are thrown into folds, both outside and on the inside. So why is the small intestine presented in this kind of configuration? This is to increase the surface area of the small intestine. So there are more of the functions of complete digestion of food particles that is coming from the stomach, and also more of the function of absorption of minerals and nutrients will be increased. If you cut out the a region that is thrown into infoldings, you see that the surface area of the region that has infolds is always more than a plain surface. And that is why this will help to increase the surface area of the action that the small intestine performs. So let's try and drive in on the subdivisions of the small intestine. The, the small intestine is subdivided into three regions. We have the duodenum. This is the duodenum here. And this region is the first region of the small intestine. It is this region that is seen to be continuous with the phylorous region of the stomach, which is the terminal region of the stomach. So this is the duodenum. The duodenum is about 25 centimeter in length, which means that it is the shortest of the three subdivisions of the small intestine. Most digestion occur in the duodenum because it is in this region that we have the opening of the bile and also the pancreatic juice. So the duodenum is where most of the digestive processes occur. And the next region after the duodenum is the jejunum. This is the jejunum here. The jejunum is the second longest region, and it is about 2.5 meters in length, the region where we have most of the absorption. And the last region, which is the terminal region of the small intestine, is the ileum. This is the longest region and is about 3.5 meters in length. This region allows for the absorption of specific substances, which include vitamins. The helium is the region that is continuous with the cecum, which is the initial or the first segment of the large intestine. Also for us to add that there are some distinct points or junction within the small intestine that we should highlight. At the point where the duodenum unites with the jejunum, at this region that is banked, is called the duodenum jejunal junction. This is followed with the next junction where the jejunum becomes linked with the ileum, and this is called the jejunoiliac junction. And the last junction that is good for us to highlight is the ileocecal junction, which is the region where the ileum connects with the cecum. The cecum is the first region of the large intestine. And I've always said this, that the only thing we need to do when we have to composite name is for us to break it down to know what they mean. So by breaking it down, you know the specific region that are connected. Then going further on peritoneal relations, the small intestine are related to peritoneum in different ways. And of course, there are different regions have specific relations to peritoneum. But generally, the small intestine is known to be an intraperitoneal organ. But let's drive into this to see how this is established in different subregions of the small intestine. Generally, the small intestine is known to be mobile, and it is mobile because of the formation of mesentery. How is mesentery formed? Let's also look at this image. Let's say this is the organ that is highlighted in red, and the relations of organs to peritoneum is used to establish whether they are intraperitoneal organ or retroperitoneal organ. For intraperitoneal organ, it means that all the surfaces are related to peritoneum. So you see the peritoneum enclosing the entire surface of the organ, and at the tail end, you have a double layered membrane that comes out at one end after running through the entire surface. And this region is called the mesentery. It is through this mesentery that this organ is not taped to the wall where this organ is located. This will help to allow the movement of this organ. 
And that is why intraperitoneal organs are mobile, because these will be able to move as they want, because the peritoneum is covering the entire surface, not leaving it with a mess entry at one end, and the organ will be able to move as they want. Also to add that the length of the mess entry that is derived after covering the entire surface of this organ will determine the grade of movement. So the longer the length of the mess entry, the wider the grade of movement. If you try to do a physical application Application, you see that if you have short mesh entry, the range of movement will not be as much as when the mesh entry is longer. Then the other kind of presentation that is seen between organs and also peritoneum is retroperitoneal presentation. Let's say this is the organ. I have the peritoneum just running on just one surface of the organ. So let's say this is the organ. I have the peritoneum here. You see that it's just covering just one surface. And as it covers, it is helping to hold that organ in place to the wall or the cavities that they are located. So that is why we say that retroperitoneal organs are immobile because they are being held in place by the peritoneum because it's seen to cover just one of its surface. Unlike the intraperitoneal organ where it is seen to line through the entire surface of the organ. So that is the basis onto which intra and retroperitoneal organs are established. But for the small intestine, the bulk of the small intestine is intraperitoneal. That means the peritoneum is seen to cover the entire surface of the organ. And that is why we have the establishment of mesentery. So let's first look at the different regions of the small intestine. How how they are related to peritoneum. For the duodenum, the duodenum we already said that is the first region of the small intestine. The first two centimeters of the first region of the small intestine is an intraperitoneal organ. That means that the entire surface of this region is covered by peritoneum. While the remaining region of the duodenum is a retroperitoneal organ, which means that the duodenum is more of a retroperitoneal presentation because it's just the initial two centimeter of about 25 centimeter that is intraperitoneal. That means this region will be fixed. And that is why we say that the duodenum is the most fixed region of the small intestine because the bulk of it is retroperitoneal. So you can try and apply this image down to the duodenum to see how it will be positioned and the relation of the peritoneum to the duodenum. Then if you go down, to the jejunum and the ileum, they are intraperitoneal organs, which means that the entire surface is covered by peritoneum. So you now have the development of mesentery, which is attached or connected to the posterior abdominal wall. So you can see that there are differences between the different regions of the small intestine. But the bulk of the small intestine, which contains the ileum, the jejunum, and also the initial two centimeters of the duodenum are intraperitoneal. So the bulk of the small intestine is of intraperitoneal presentation. But let's go further to see how the mesenteries are formed and are connected. We already said that because of the pattern of connection of peritoneum to organs, there's going to be the development of mesentery at one hand. This is the organ, and the organ, because it is intraperitoneal, it is within or inside the peritoneum. The entire surface of this organ is covered by peritoneum. There's going to be the emergence of a doubled layered region at one end. So it is this structure that is now called the mesentery. Through this mesentery, this organ will be connected to the body wall. And this is what is seen in this image. This is the small intestine. We already said that is a folded region of the GIT. And this mesentery, you can see the way they emerge at one end. Having covered the entire surface of the organ, they are now being connected to the posterior abdominal wall. So for you to remove the small intestine from the abdominal cavity, you need to unplug the mesentery because this mesentery is fixed to the back. That's the posterior abdominal wall. And this we can illustrate when we try to slaughter our rams or goats that you need to remove the intestine. You need to pluck it up from the back because the mesentery is what is connected to the posterior abdominal wall and it needs to be unplugged so that the intestine can now be removed. So the essence of this is to structurally anchor or hold the small intestine in place. So it helps to keep it in place or hold it in frame within the abdominal cavity. It's also a means through which blood vessels transport to the organs. So we have Within the mesentery, we have blood vessels 
running through it. So apart from creating structural support, they also help to allow the passage of vessels. Let's look at the blood supply of the small intestine. We already established that the small intestine has three subregions, the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum. For the duodenum, it is supplied by branches from the celiac trunk and also the superior mesenteric artery. So this duodenum here is supplied by branches from the celiac trunk and the superior mesenteric artery. The second region, which is the duodenum, is supplied by branches from the superior mesenteric artery. And this is the jejunum. And the terminal region of the small intestine, which is the ileum, supplied by also branches from the superior mesenteric artery. So thanks for watching this video. Let's meet again.